All right, we're taking some of your questions in this segment here on this Wednesday edition of PFT Live. We put out the call. The questions have been screened. And let's begin with Brian Byrne, who goes by the Twitter handle at Brian Burnsy. Come on, man. Stidham over Tua. Fourth round pick who's thrown two passes for a pick six. You just know Tua's popularity is through the roof, and you did this for clickbait. Be better. I love it when they accuse us of clickbait where there's nothing to click. What's what's there to click? It's not clickbait. I don't know either. It's, it's I a don't fact. know either. No, you know, and hey, listen, at Brian Bernsey, I, I appreciate the thought, you know, and again, I hate that clickbait crap. I do. I don't give a damn about whether you click on it or not, Brian Bernsey, okay? You know, I don't. I'm doing this because this is what I love to do, and this is what I believe, and this is where my studies and, you know, with all the great people I've been fortunate to learn from and be around and all those things, that's where I've come up with this assessment. And I don't give a damn that the NFL got it wrong and drafted Jared Sidham in the fourth round. That doesn't matter. He was a first-round pick that a lot of idiots in the football fell for the old, whoa, the team wasn't good, the quarterback must have not been good. You know, if you put Tua on that Auburn team that Jared Stidham played with that last year in Auburn, uh, Tua probably would have been relegated to the fourth round as well. You know, so Jared Stidham is plan A for the New England Patriots. They like what they see. They know he is starting quarterback material. And Mike, I don't know if you know anybody in New England, if you've heard those same thoughts, but uh, I'm a big fan of Jared Stidham, and I think he's going to be the quarterback, and we'll still be talking about him for the New England Patriots five years from now. My opinion in that regard has been gleaned from the things that players have said publicly by the circumstances. The circumstantial evidence is strong. Bill Belichick knows a thing or two about football. Josh McDaniels knows a thing or two about offense. They wouldn't have drafted him. They wouldn't have groomed him. They wouldn't have essentially shrugged their shoulders when Tom Brady was packing up his stuff and leaving Boston if they didn't believe that they had something in Jared Stidham. And right. those six Super Bowls that the Patriots have won over the course of the past 20 years would tend to, I think, at least by a sliver of doubt for Bill Belichick as we wait to see what Stidham has. And with Tua, there's the question of, is he damaged goods? Is he going to be able to hold up at the NFL level? I think that's part of the the evaluation as well. Plenty of others, though, have chimed in, taking issue with your decision to put Stidham ahead of Tua. That's been a common theme, and and, and yep. we'll see. And, and another thing I like about you, if you're ultimately wrong, you'll say so. I you know, will. It, I'm you, not, you, you, you're not, yeah. you're not going to defend it and say, I really was right. If it's proven that you're wrong, you, you admit you're wrong. And, and that's no, good. I, that's refreshing. Yeah. Not enough people do that either. Well, it's not a right or wrong business. You're not always going to be just like, oh, plain as day, right or wrong. You know, no, it's it's an evaluation. It's projections. There's a lot of things that go into it. There's so many moving parts. And, you know, again, like I just said, you know, I, hey, listen, I think my credentials are pretty good in, the, in this area. Uh, but at the same time, do I think that everything I say or do goes in, you know, the holy grail and written in stone? No, absolutely not. You're going to mess up in this business. If Bill Belichick can mess up a draft pick, then damn Chris Sims can mess up a draft evaluation or a quarterback ranking. I, I know that. It's, it's just not a perfect business that way. Andy, who goes by the Twitter handle at Tape Merchant, would like to know the answer to this question. Do you think Tyrod Taylor, the Chargers quarterback this year, has a shot of winning comeback player of the year? Chris, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, what, what do you think? I, I think there's a real good chance. I do. You know, I just think with, you know, again, as we know, with these type of awards, it's about, yes, you have to have some good stats, but then it has to be the team is playing well in a high level, too, to justify, hey, this guy was a comeback player and it helped his team out and do all those things. And I think the Chargers have an appropriate support system to make that happen for Tyrod Taylor. You know, when you go from, you know, what were they last year, 5-11, and 11, and then all of a sudden you're back in the playoff conversation and you're the quarterback, you have a good chance to win that award. Here's the thing about Comeback Player of the Year, and, and this applies to MVP. You know, some of these other awards that are given out every year by the AP, there really isn't a lot of definition as to what it means. What are you coming back from? Yeah, are you coming right, back from right. injury? Are you coming back from being benched? Ryan Tannehill came back from not being very good. Right. I mean, Matthew Stafford won comeback player of the year. I think in 2011, it's like he was never here. What's he coming <laughs> back to? He never right. did anything. He has one good year and he's comeback player of the year. So it's a very vague and amorphous category, but he would fit 
within the confines of comeback player of the year if he comes out and has a huge season. He's got to have a huge season. He's got to lead the Chargers to the postseason. I mean, just like Ryan Tannehill did last year, it's got to be a surprise. It's got to be the kind of thing that gets our attention and says, wow, Tyrod Taylor, even though he was never a great quarterback, right? He took a team to the playoffs. He's 20, right. what, 26, 23, and one as a starter. So, yeah, I think that if if he would lead the Chargers to a postseason appearance, have 4,000 passing yards, uh, they go, you know, 11 and five, 10 and six. Yeah, he'd be one of the candidates for comeback player of the year. Now, you don't determine that in a vacuum because we don't know who else out there coming back, like a Ben Roethlisberger. If the Steelers go 12 and four and win the division, he'll probably be comeback player of the year. But uh, it, it all depends on who else is in the mix. But I think that Tyrod Taylor, if he plays well and the Chargers win games, will be in the mix, Chris. Yeah, I, I do too. I do. You know, the, the defense is good. We know that. I think they've made the appropriate, you know, fixes to the offense. They've improved that offensive line. There is some good receivers. They got Hunter Henry. Hopefully he can stay healthy. And yeah, when you look at all those angles and then Tyrod Taylor, who's a guy who is not known to take a lot of chances or be careless with the football. So he's not going to lose games for the Chargers that way. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think he's one of those guys that I would put a little mark next to to say, watch out for this guy. He could be a, a comeback player of the year candidate. All right. Next question comes from Brad Smith. I assume this is not the same Brad Smith we mentioned just within the past half hour catching the touchdown pass from Ryan Fitzpatrick while playing for the Jets. It would be one hell of a coincidence if it is. At Brad versus all, would you rather have Christian McCaffrey at his current contract or Odell Beckham Jr. at his current contract? Chris, I, I, know, I already know the answer to this. I, well, so you're going to take Odell Beckham Jr. I always take Odell Beckham right? Jr., don't I? If exactly. it's positive or something, exactly. yeah, yes. But but I do think, like, it legitimately I would here, even as a, you know, I know I'm fanboy of OBJ. That's my guy. And, yes, I root for him. I like Christian McCaffrey a whole lot, too. But – I think, too, the other thing that you have to play into this this question or the answer is, you know, Odell Beckham Jr., the current status of his contract. I mean, a lot of the big money's been paid. So, you know, there's more wiggle room By someone room else. Here. Well, you're it right. It was paid by, by the Giants. Else. So I think just from that standpoint alone, I'd rather have OBJ in his contract at this point with instead of a running back who's just starting a big money contract. And we know how brutal that position is and everything like that. So – I think leg legitimately I would take OBJ here, even though it's close. What do you think? A average salary under the McCaffrey deal is $16 million. Average under the Beckham deal is 18 Now, look, you're right. The big money's already been paid out, and it was paid out by the Giants. Um, I, it's a tough Christian one. Christian McCaffrey well, – well, but, but look, ha I, here, here's one argument. Christian McCaffrey yeah. touches the ball more frequently than Odell Beckham Jr. Definitely. He's a running back. He's a receiver. He's an all-around weapon. Right. So right. he has you could argue he's got more intrinsic value to your team that way. But a great receiver affects the offense, even if he's not touching the football, no because doubt he opens up it. the offense for everybody else. So right. that's the that's the response to that. It doesn't matter if Odo Beckham Jr. isn't getting 30 touches a game and what receiver is ever going to get that. But his presence allows the running back, allows Nick Chubb to be Nick Chubb in Cleveland. Whereas if you didn't have Christian McCaffrey and you had Odo Beckham Jr., maybe you could draft a guy who comes in and you're paying him peanuts who can have a hell of an impact because you've got double coverage all the time on OBJ. So uh, I hate to do yeah. it. I'm going to agree with you. I think it's you. OBJ too. I'd, I know. I'd, if I can, and now I got him at four more years. But I got fourteen million, fourteen five, thirteen seven five, thirteen seven five, and here's the thing: at some point in the course of the next four years, he's going to want to raise. You have to factor that yeah. into it as well. I that's, think that's and he probably true. already right. does. But uh, I, I think that the impact of his presence, um, it it outweighs the the difference between what McCaffrey does and what the next man up would do for a hell of a lot less money, if that makes any I, sense at all. No, no, I, I think it does. It makes a whole lot of sense. Also, you know, you could play the angle, too, that, you know, when you get to this point of the career with guys that are running back and a receiver, we see that, you know, more times than not, the receivers play at a higher level for a longer time than the running backs. The running backs tend to fall off you know, year four, five, six, where all of a sudden we see a slippage and explosion and some of the things they can do physically. But the big thing, Mike, is is what you're talking about. I mean, it's very real. It, it really jumped out to me last year in Cleveland, even when he wasn't 100%. You know, teams show him so much attention, and there's always two people over him. 
and he could be running a five yard shallow cross route and there's two guys chasing after him and it opens up everybody else and helps the run game and helps Jarvis Landry, the tight ends, all of that. So, uh, you know, I'm expecting a big year from Odell, as we know, because I think last year was a little lackluster for, for his standards. But uh, I agree with you. I, you know, it's a big effect on the team. He'd be one of those guys I'd love to show fans what he really does on film and how it affects the whole offense and the overall game itself. Now we should do that sometime. We, we've yeah. got we've got time. We've got opportunities. You're Maybe right. that's something we do to 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 illustrate the impact of a great receiver on the rest of an offense because it is very real. And I think that's what tipped the scales for me. All right, one more real quickly at Br Adams. What will the NFL do if a player tests positive? For the coronavirus, obviously, the day after playing in a game. Let me try this one first. I, yeah, I think you what go happens first. Is the player gets the player gets quarantined, and it's not like you need to do contact tracing because everybody's going to be getting tested all the time anyway. Contact tracing is relevant where you're otherwise not going to be tested. You're going about your life. But I think with every player being tested every day, and I think they need to be tested on the way into the facility and on the way out of the facility. Players, coaches. Everyone who's in that Petri dish that is the NFL locker room needs to be tested every day, arguably twice per day. You, you, the guy's positive the day after playing in a game. He's shut down for however long they agree. Players are going to be shut down once they test positive, period. And well, that's part well, of what the NFL and the NFL Players Association need to work out. That's, a, that's exactly it. I mean, they do. I mean, what, what happens if that happens and then we find out, you know, three days later that, you know, half the team that they just played also test positive and, you know, the guy uh, on Team A that was the original positive test, how half his team test positive. See, these are things, too, that this is where the NFL and NFLPA got to start talking this out right now. They got to get it going. They got to understand or, you know, will NFL players just basically say, well, we don't care that there's coronavirus in the locker room. Let's just keep playing the hell with it. I think you might get more positive answers that way than people realize. But we don't know. And I just I, that, that's where I keep stressing this over the last two weeks. I would hope some of these conversations are happening behind the scenes right now uh, because uh, this is what I do fear, that we play three weeks of football and all of a sudden two guys in the league get it and we find out on a Monday morning and all of a sudden two teams are devastated and have the COVID-19 virus. And then where do we go? Do we cancel the league or cancel a few weeks of games? I don't know. And, and again, that's why it's a deep subject. Now, and, and you're absolutely right. We don't know how this is going to play out. They don't know how it's going to play out. But the reality is, if there's a guy who makes his way into a locker room, onto a practice field, or onto a game site, and is positive, and he's shedding virus, as the experts say, it's going to get around. And others yeah. are going to have it. And others are going to test positive. And how, how many extra guys are you going to need on the roster? I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh the solution may just be shut down everyone who's positive and go out and, and sign as many players as you need to sign. They're going to need some sort of a short-term IR designation where you come and go. Uh, you're, you're on the coronavirus list for two weeks and good point, Mike. your roster spot is open right. and it's going to be, look, if they were willing in the 1987 strike to go out and find replacement players for three weeks to keep the games going, they will do it. If players are unable to play because they're positive for the coronavirus, they'll be down and someone else steps up and it's going to take more. I think than just 10 guys on the practice squad, you're going to have to have other guys in reserve ready to go at a moment's notice to come in and play in the event, like you said, half the team ends up testing positive out of the blue. Yeah, that's, and you know, that's, that's tough. Yeah. I don't, you know, those are things I look at right now and you just go, man, I mean, yeah, this is quite the contingency plan that you're going to have to worry about. And yeah, maybe they're going to have to expand the, the practice squad this year and the rosters a little bit because of that. So where, yeah, you got to have a, a little more extra, you know, some extra guys to come off the bench and help the team out. Because the other thing too, Mike, that I would be scared of, if you just like start signing guys off the street on a Wednesday or Thursday afternoon, and uh, now they got to play in a game on Sunday, one, I'm worried about their health and safety because they're not going to be in football shape and ready to go. And then two, I'm also going to be worried about the other guys that got to play with this guy because because he's not going to be in football shape and the, the legs and knees might be wobbly and he might get tired. And he's not used to getting knocked around from all different angles. He can end up hurting somebody else too. 
So that's that's a real worry. And uh, again, I think these are other these are points that the the NFL and the NFLPA. I would I would I just want to hear more dialogue or more about it. And I don't hear anything, and that scares me a little. Last thing on this for now, we may discuss it at PFTOT. Look at what the XFL did during their short run. They had a ninth team of guys who were constantly kept in game shape and available to be called up at a moment's notice. Maybe they need to have teams that aren't playing but practicing and ready to go, and you just cherry-pick guys off of those teams Maybe. as needed based upon who tests positive. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.